Hello, my name's Andrew Granger and I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist based in Leeds in the UK. In this presentation, we're going to discuss septic arthritis, tenosynovitis and bursitis, which are important diagnoses you must feel able and comfortable to make. We will discuss the mechanisms and some clinical aspects of septic arthritis before talking about the imaging features we expect to see. We will also consider some of the non-pyogenic atypical causes of infective arthritis and discuss the complications of joint infection. Finally, I'm going to address infection involving bursi and the tenosynovium. There are some areas I will not have time to cover. However, it's important that you make yourselves aware of the special issues relating to infection in the spine, infection involving the prosthetic joint, and paediatric joint infection. In native joints, the most common route of joint infection is hematogenous spread. Here, a transient or sustained bacteremia gains access to the joint through the synovial membrane. Synovium lacks a protective basement membrane and access by blood-borne bacteria is relatively easy. Clearly, conditions increasing blood flow to the synovium have the potential to increase the risk of joint sepsis. Infection need not necessarily spread to a joint from a remote source. An infection in adjacent bone can spread via the blood to the synovium and then into the joint. In this case, of course, you won't see a communication between the site of bone infection and the joint. Besides hematogenous spread, infection can reach a joint through direct inoculation, either as a result of medical procedures or through other mechanisms of penetrating injury, including animal or indeed human bites. Finally, infection can reach a joint through direct spread from an adjacent source of infection, such as a soft tissue collection, or via direct spread from infection in an adjacent bone. Septic arthritis is relatively common, and in a busy practice you should expect to come across cases fairly frequently. As highlighted on this slide, many of the patients with bacterial septic arthritis will have a history of prior joint disease. Many causes of joint disease will predispose to joint infection, including the main forms of arthritis, previous trauma to a joint, and recent joint surgery even when inoculation of the joint has not occurred at the time of surgery. Joint sepsis is a particularly common complication of rheumatoid arthritis and can lead to catastrophic outcomes. The risks are high because besides the pre-existing joint damage, patients are frequently immunosuppressed and patients will often have poor skin condition, allowing easier access for the infection. In addition, diagnosis of septic arthritis in these patients is often delayed as it is mistaken for a flare in the rheumatoid arthritis and signs, symptoms and clinical lab tests may be unimpressive as a result of the immunosuppression. Acute gout and pseudogout are great mimics of sepsis, but these conditions also predispose to septic arthritis. The possibility that you're dealing with sepsis rather than an acute flare-up of the crystal arthritis should always be considered. Among the other risk factors for septic arthritis, two broad groups are seen. These are conditions associated with compromised immunity, such as diabetes, liver or renal disease, and immunosuppressive therapy, and conditions leading to loss of skin integrity, such as dermatological conditions, and the use and abuse of IV drugs. We saw earlier how joint sepsis is a relatively common problem but it's also worth considering that it is becoming more common and affecting an increasing elderly population, in part as a result of the comorbidities and the often complex hospital admissions these patients have. Another problem is the increased frequency with which we are seeing infection with antibiotic-resistant organisms. By far and away, the most common organism involved in adult joint sepsis is Staphylococcus, and particularly Staph aureus. As already noted, antibiotic-resistant strains are an increasing problem. Streptococci and gram-negative bacilli are roughly equal but less frequent causes, and the remainder are made up of less common organisms, of which TB, making up around 2% of cases of joint sepsis, and gonococcus, 
are the most significant. Although the presentation of septic arthritis is classically monoarticular, it is worth bearing in mind that up to a fifth of patients will have polyarticular disease. In adults, the knee is far more frequently involved than any other joint in the appendicular skeleton. The hip is second most commonly affected, but hip involvement is significantly less frequent than knee infection. This is in contrast to the situation in children, where the knee and hip are affected with similar frequency. When the patient presents with the classic picture of fever, rigors, and an inflamed swollen joint, the diagnosis of septic arthritis is fairly straightforward. However, this presentation is less common than one might expect, with high-grade fever being seen in less than 60% of patients and as many as 50% of patients failing to show a raised white cell count. To complicate matters further, joint pain and other features of inflammation may not be apparent in patients who are immunocompromised. For instance, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis who are on corticosteroids. So now we turn to the radiological appearances of septic arthritis. In the early stages of the disease, the conventional radiograph will often be unremarkable. However, radiographs should still form the first line imaging investigation and if nothing else can be extremely useful in providing a baseline for further follow-up. However, the key findings to look for on a radiograph are an effusion, seen as swelling and the usual classical features such as a displaced fat pad in the elbow or a thickened suprapatellar stripe in the knee, periarticular osteopenia, which in these patients can be marked, joint space narrowing, representing cartilage loss, and of course erosion and bone destruction. Ultimately, we may see joint ankylosis. A characteristic of untreated pyogenic joint infection is rapid progression of the changes. This gives an indication of why it is important to recognize and treat joint sepsis as early as possible. This is well illustrated in this case of unrecognized ankle joint infection. At presentation, we can appreciate some early and relatively subtle joint space narrowing on the AP radiograph. And on the lateral, there is evidence of a joint effusion seen as anterior joint line soft tissue swelling. However, look now at how the joint space narrowing has progressed in just one month. You can also appreciate periarticular osteopenia that has developed and on careful inspection, we can see there is early erosion of the fibula. Finally, just three months after that first radiograph, there is catastrophic failure of the joint with more marked bone destruction on both sides of the joint associated with increasing osteopenia and joint space narrowing and the development of a pathological lateral malleolar fracture. Here is another case, this time showing rapid progression of joint destruction in a septic pubic symphysis. Although notice that even on the baseline study, there is erosive change evident in the left pubic bone. This case of wrist joint infection shows how severe osteopenia can be, particularly when seen alongside the normal contralateral wrist. It is worth always keeping infection in mind when faced with a symptomatic joint. To diagnose it, you need to think of it. Ultimately, aspiration of the suspected joint will be often needed to confirm the diagnosis. Even when the diagnosis is apparent, aspiration will commonly be required to obtain an organism to guide treatment. Certainly in my practice, ultrasound is most frequently used to guide aspiration, as in this case of hip sepsis. On this longitudinal ultrasound of an infected hip, we can appreciate the acetabulum, femoral head, and the effusion to be aspirated. It is important to realize that the ultrasound appearances of a joint effusion cannot be relied on to distinguish joint infection from a sterile effusion. An infected joint effusion can have a complex echogenic appearance as we see in this image showing the posterior aspect of the glenohumeral joint. However, complex effusions can be seen in non-septic joint disease. Furthermore, joint sepsis, as seen in the upper image here, can have an anechoic appearance, 
Perhaps as a diagnostic tool, ultrasound is most useful when it demonstrates there is no joint effusion, as a dry joint strongly suggests there is no septic joint. However, a dry joint doesn't exclude bone sepsis. CT and MRI can be very helpful when joints are difficult to visualise radiographically, such as the sternoclavicular and sacroiliac joints. This MRI study demonstrates septic arthritis in the left sacroiliac joint. CT is also helpful for guiding aspiration, where a joint is not amenable to ultrasound guidance. MRI is very sensitive for the demonstration of joint infection. However, it is very non-specific, and it is particularly poor at distinguishing joint sepsis from other causes of joint inflammation, such as rheumatoid arthritis. The presence of subchondral marrow changes and surrounding soft tissue edema favour infection, but may not be present. In septic arthritis, MRI typically shows subchondral edema with low T1 signal and increased T2 signal, as we can see here in this case of glenohumeral joint sepsis. We can also appreciate the marked periarticular edema, and in addition to the chondral damage, we can appreciate the early erosive change in the bone. This is the case of infective sacroiliitis I showed previously. In addition to the joint effusion, and bone and soft tissue edema, we can appreciate periarticular collections both anterior and posterior to the joint. MRI is excellent for showing this periarticular extension of the disease and may also show the source of infection if it has spread from periarticular disease. On this slice, slightly more superior to the previous, we can see extension of the collection into the psoas and paravertebral musculature here shown with thick enhancing walls on the post-contrast imaging. So far, we've been discussing the appearances of pyogenic septic arthritis. However, we should consider the differences we may see with atypical infections. Tuberculous arthritis is something we see with increasing frequency, accounting for nearly 2% of joint infections. It is most commonly seen in children and young adults and occurs by direct spread from TB osteomyelitis or by hematogenous spread. The large weight-bearing joints are most commonly involved. It's really important to recognize that a normal chest radiograph does not exclude articular or indeed osseous TB. TB arthritis follows a much more indolent course than pyogenic disease, producing gradual progressive pain and swelling, with symptoms often being present for over a year before diagnosis is made. It may be mistaken for OA, as you might expect, delayed diagnosis means that TB arthritis is often associated with big collections, involvement of bone and significant joint damage. One feature of TB arthritis is that joint space narrowing occurs relatively late, as TB does not easily destroy cartilage. In fact, with a large joint effusion, there may actually be widening of the joint space as the tense effusion pushes the bones apart. The classic description of the radiographic appearances of TB arthritis describes three features known as the femister triad. This emphasizes the late and gradual loss of joint space seen in TB, in contrast to the rapid joint destruction we saw earlier with pyogenic arthritis. This patient had had left hip pain for about six months before seeking medical attention. As you can see, there is periarticular osteopenia, but in contrast to the pyogenic cases I showed earlier, the joint space is still relatively well preserved. MRI shows the bone edema, joint effusion and synovitis with periarticular edema. Later in the disease, sclerosis may become a feature of TB arthritis as demonstrated in this elbow joint. In contrast to pyogenic joint infection, osseous ankylosis of the joint is relatively unusual. With TB, severe joint involvement more commonly leads to a fibrous union across the joint. Similar features are seen with mycobacterium affecting the small joints, as in this interphalangeal thumb joint. Note again the severe bone destruction despite the preservation of joint space. There is also periarticular soft tissue calcification evident. This is an example of a well-recognized atypical mycobacterium infection carried by fish, Mycobacterium marinum.
Involvement of the hands is typical, the infection gaining access to the body through open wound contact with contaminated water, fish bites, or injury with contaminated marine or angling equipment. A radiological feature sometimes seen with TB joint sepsis is the presence of rice bodies within the joint. These are multiple small bodies seen within the joint resembling grains of polished rice. While there are a variety of causes for this finding, including joint infection with other organisms, TB arthritis is one of the more frequent causes, and this example of TB arthritis affecting a sternoclavicular joint shows this finding, with numerous intermediate signal densities shown against the high signal joint effusion and synovitis on T2-weighted imaging. The extent of synovitis is well shown on the T1 post-contrast imaging. Ultrasound will also show these bodies as brightly echogenic foci, as demonstrated in this case of TB affecting a shoulder joint. In addition to infective causes and rheumatoid arthritis, rice bodies may also be seen with any causes of chronic long-standing synovitis or bursitis. Rice bodies are fibrinous in nature, probably relating to the shedding of infarcted synovium into joint. This distinguishes them histologically from the chondroid lesions of synovial chondromatosis. However, with imaging small chondroid bodies, when they are multiple, such as seen here in the lower image, are indistinguishable from fibrinous rice bodies seen in a case of rheumatoid arthritis in the upper image. Another atypical organism causing joint infection that warrants mention is the Borrelia spirochete carried by ticks and causing Lyme disease. This is commonly seen in the northeast United States and in northern Europe, where its incidence is on the rise. Nearly a third of patients presenting with Lyme disease will experience joint symptoms. Early in the disease, patients present with a non-specific joint effusion, as seen here. Although note the typical periarticular edema. If untreated, the condition leads to chronic joint damage. Fungal organisms can also cause infective arthritis, such as coccidiomycosis, shown here. In this condition, osseous lesions, seen in the fibula in this case, are common, with relatively good preservation of the joint space. Of course, any synovial line structure can become infected, so in addition to joints, we can also see infective bursitis and tenosynovitis. Generally, the mode of inoculation in these structures tends to be through trauma, including needle puncture. As with joint infection, aspiration will generally be required to make the diagnosis. Bursi and tendon sheaths can be large and provide a means for infection to track to sites remote from the original point of entry. A good example of this is seen in the hand. Because of the anatomy of the tendon sheaths and volar wrist bursi, an injury introducing infection into the flexor tendon sheath of the thumb, for instance, can result in the infection spreading rapidly across the hand to the little finger tendon sheath, resulting in a so-called horseshoe abscess. You should note that there are a number of variations in this anatomy in the hand, but the configuration I show here is the most common. Finishing up, we should just highlight complications of infection of joints and other synovial structures. The first is that infection may spread from the synovial line structure into adjacent structures such as the bone. In this case of staphylococcal infection of the olecranon bursa, acquired through a penetrating injury, the infection has spread to involve the triceps tendon and bone edema is seen in the olecranon itself, representing early osteomyelitis. Septic arthritis can lead to a long-term joint abnormality and deformity. In children, this is particularly true where there may be damage to the physeal growth plate. The associated growth disturbance may take time to become apparent. Other complications of septic arthritis include avascular necrosis and secondary osteoarthritis. And, as we've seen, some patients, such as in this case on the left hip, will end up with an ankylosed joint. So that concludes my presentation. My hope is that you are now familiar with the means by which joints become infected. Remember too that pre-existing joint disease and a variety of other conditions predispose to septic arthritis. I discussed the radiographic appearances of joint sepsis, including the rapid joint destruction that can occur with pyogenic infection.
I also mentioned the early osteopenia that is typically seen around infected joints. As we saw, infected joints will usually end up requiring aspiration. I highlighted that while very sensitive to joint effusions and other changes in septic arthritis, MRI and ultrasound are non-specific. Also, remember how TB arthritis runs a much more indolent course with relative preservation of joint space. However, my ultimate take-home point is that to diagnose joint, bursal or tenosynovial infection, you must first think of it. The possible diagnosis often gets forgotten, especially if the presentation is atypical. So thank you very much for watching.